today we are in part two of a series that Pastor Anthony kicked off last week titled First Things First. And what we are talking about in this series is we're doing a dive into the book of Colossians. And so if you were here last week, then you would have heard Pastor Anthony breaking down Colossians chapter one. It was a fantastic message. I'd encourage you, if you missed last week, jump back on, get that first message, listen to it again, and uh, even just like read the book of Colossians with us over this next month. Kind of make that some of your time in your morning devotions or things like that to, uh, to dive into this book with us. But today I want to talk about Colossians chapter two. And uh, if I was giving this message a little subtitle, I'd like to call this good enough. So I'm gonna say good enough, good enough. And if there's one verse that I really feel like kind of summarizes the overarching theme of Colossians chapter two, it's this one. Uh, verse, uh, chapter two, verse six to seven, it says this, that as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Let's pray real quick. Father, we are so thankful for this day. We are thankful that you are with us. We thank you that we can gather together like this this morning. And we just pray that in these next 30 minutes that you would just reveal to us, God, your goodness and your grace, that we would walk out of this room uplifted, encouraged, knowing your care and your attention towards us. And uh, may those goats in the parking lot please be delicious. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Awesome. Well, thank you, Peter. You're the man. Go catch one of those goats for us. Get it ready for after service. Uh, but uh, quick question for you guys, okay? Quick show of hands. Quick show of hands. Who here would consider themselves to be a clean person? Okay, I don't just mean like you showered this morning, but like you are neat, you are tidy, you put things away, you like to vacuum. And uh, how many of you sitting next to someone with their hand up, are you like, you sure about that? Anybody? <laughs> Like, are you, are you really sure? Are you really sure about that? I know I might not always look it, but I am actually a pretty tidy person. I like things neat. I like things organized. I like things put away. And uh, the reason for that is because growing up, I was given no other option, okay? The Neufeld home is a strict German household where things have places and they go where they belong. That in my home growing up, uh, cleaning, it was not an afterthought. It was not a side quest. It wasn't something that you would fit in if you maybe had time for it. It was a priority, okay? Games were not played. Uh, friends were not hung out with. Saturday morning cartoons were not watched until the house was clean, okay? My weekend alarm clock growing up was the sound of my dad with the vacuum banging against the door, right? That was at like seven in the morning. And uh, it drove me crazy as a kid. It frustrated me so much. I just wanted to bask in my filth and just be messy and everything that a teenage boy is. Uh, but my parents just would not allow it. And so I got really good at something. And that is not being clean. That is putting on the appearance of being clean, right? You know what I mean? Where it's like things look tidy, things look put away, just don't open the closet. Anyone, anybody relate to me? And uh, yeah, yeah, you feel me, you feel me. It's, uh, I like it when things are neat. I really like, it's important to me that things are tidy and things are put away, um, or at least they're just out of sight. That's what's important to me. And I think it's kind of funny how, uh, how oftentimes the things that frustrate us the most about our family are the things that we become. Is anybody related to that? Uh, we just kind of start adopting the behaviors that frustrated us when we were younger. And so all of a sudden, in the last maybe five or six years, I've kind of really enjoyed cleaning the house on Saturdays. I wake up and it's like eight o'clock on a Saturday. I'm like, you know what would be really sweet? Vacuuming. <laughs> That'd be really fun right now. I, uh, I bought a Dyson a couple months ago and I was, I was, uncomfortably excited about it. It was, <laughs> I shouldn't be this happy about a new vacuum. I was really pumped about it. It's probably my favorite thing I've purchased all year. Um, but anyways, anyways, I do, I really enjoy being clean. I really enjoy being tidy. I like having my house put together, but some things never change. And I would consider myself to be 
a cosmetic cleaner, okay? What do I mean by that? I mean, if you were to come over after church today, my house would appear very clean. Just don't open the cupboards, okay? <laughs> right? You all have that one drawer with the spatulas and the ladles and all those sorts of things, and you just keep shoving more into it. You never throw anything out. You just find room. You have to put it away super precisely to get the drawer to close. Or the Tupperware drawer. Nobody has an organized Tupperware drawer. Let's be real. Tupperwares are to be squished. They are not to be stacked. Um, but but, uh, but I, I love like the appearance of clean, and if I can't see it, and I can't smell it, then it is, in my standards, good enough, okay? Now, I think that while our standards may be different, our standards may shift, I think something we all have in common is that we all share that sentiment of good enough, all right? And maybe it's not just in the context of cleanliness, but I think that good enough is a sentiment, it's a feeling that we carry into all sorts of areas of our lives. Like maybe some of you are in university right now or you can remember being in university and you remember writing papers and it's maybe not a perfect paper, it's not the best paper, it could be better, but you hit that word count and you get enough references, you hit spell check and it is good enough, right? Or maybe some of you guys are like trying to feed your kids healthy, nutritious food, right? You want them eating vitamins and vegetables and like healthy things to help them grow into strong young men and women. But all your kids have eyes for is that bag of frozen chicken nuggets in the freezer. And it's maybe not ideal. It's maybe not the best, but it is good enough, right? Maybe some of you, and I'm not judging, you pulled that shirt out of the hamper this week and you really like that shirt, and it's a nice shirt, and you only wore it for like half the day, and you didn't even get that sweaty, and you give it a sniff, and you're like, it's, it's good enough. It's good enough, right? We all carry the sentiment of good enough. And I, I wonder sometimes that if this feeling of good enough is something that we don't just carry in our chores, or our careers, or our kids' chicken nugget-filled meal plans, but if this idea of good enough is something that we sometimes also carry into our relationship with God. Have you ever asked the question of what does it mean to be a good enough Christian? Where's the line? What does it look like to be a good Christian? I think that this is the issue that Paul is addressing in his letter to the Colossians that the Colossians were asking this question. They're trying to seek the solution to satisfy this longing in their souls. They were looking for some way to be good enough. To give you a little bit of context, the, the city of Coloss, where Paul was writing this letter to, it was a church that wasn't actually planted by Paul. It was a church that was planted out of the overflow, out of the outgrowth of the church that Paul planted in Ephesus. And now a little bit of time has gone by and this congregation has grown a little bit, but they're kind of developing what I would call a theological casserole, okay? What is a casserole? A casserole is where you take everything in the fridge, you throw it in a one pot, you just stir it all together and you make something new, okay? And so what the Colossians were doing is they were taking their basic Christian values. They took the gospel on which their faith was established and they started adding things to it. They added in a little bit of Greek philosophy. They added in a little bit of Jewish legalism. They added in a little bit of mystical pantheonism. And essentially what they believed, or what they came to believe, was that Jesus was not God, but that rather Jesus was a God. And rather than being fully man and fully God, they saw Jesus as this semi-divine being amongst their pantheon of gods. And that Jesus was responsible for bridging the gap between God and humanity. And so they respected Jesus, they honored Jesus, but there's this growing belief that Jesus just wasn't good enough. That if they wanted to attain spiritual enlightenment, that if they wanted to gain spiritual depth, that if they wanted things to get deeper and fuller, that what they had to do was add something. And so they started seeking out these solutions and things like secret knowledge, that somehow through their philosophy or their, their, their different gods, that they could combine these things into their faith and that they could somehow unlock a secret knowledge that would level up their faith, 
that would make them good enough, or they would devote themselves to this rigorous discipline, that they would beat themselves and whip themselves, that they would abstain from certain things, they would hold themselves to certain ceremonies, all in the pursuit of finding something good enough. Because at the heart of their issue, they simply believed that Jesus wasn't. And so what Paul writes to them, he says this in Colossians 2 verse 8. He gives them this warning. He says to them, beware. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. See, what is the basis of Paul's rebuke to the church of the Colossians? is that it was not a rejection of the gospel. That this group of people, there was a lot of people at the time who were angry at Christians. They were resentful towards Christians. They were antagonistic towards Christians. That was not the Colossians. The Colossians' issue was not that they were vilifying Christ. Their issue was not that they were rejecting Christ. Their issue was not that they were antagonistic towards the gospel. Their issue was that they just didn't think he was enough. It reminds me of when I was younger, my grandpa got diagnosed with diabetes. And my grandpa took this very, very seriously. And he started eating like this very regimented meal plan um, that he would like, I don't think he touched candy for like 20 years. It was crazy. Um, but somewhere along the way, somebody told him that with diabetes, uh, good food to eat is something called couscous. I had never heard of this before. Um, I don't even know if it's true, but uh, couscous is like a grain. It probably tastes great with goat, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's, it's kind of like, it's similar to rice or quinoa or something like that. And uh, my grandpa became obsessed with couscous. And it started off where it'd be like, you're having roast beef dinner, and grandpa would add a bowl of couscous on the side. But then couscous started not being added on the side of the meal. It started getting mixed into the meal. And it didn't matter what the meal was, there was couscous in the meal that we would be making soup. And grandpa would sneak over with a bowl of couscous and he would dump couscous in the soup that we'd be making a salad. And we'd look over and grandpa is stirring a big bowl of couscous into the, into the salad that we would be trying to eat like sandwiches. And grandpa's throwing couscous on your sandwich. Like you could not escape the couscous. I remember we were eating bruschetta one time, just like with some crackers and toast, like trying to just eat some little appetizers. And grandpa's putting couscous in the bruschetta. He's putting it in pasta on pizza. Like you could not escape the couscous, and here's the crazy thing, is that my grandpa was actually a pretty good cook, right? He knew his way around the kitchen. He knew how to follow a recipe, but his problem and the reason why we were all terrified to go to their house for dinner was not because he rejected the recipes, but because he felt like he needed to add to them. I think sometimes our issue is not a rejection of the gospel. It's an addition to the gospel. And sometimes trying to add something to what's already being done is just as bad as rejecting it to begin with. The issue with the Colossians was not that they were rejecting Christ. They just didn't think he was good enough. They just felt like he needed some couscous. And I wonder sometimes, sometimes we sit back and we look at these believers from 2,000 years ago. I'm like, look at those goofballs. I would never do that. Well, I Googled this week, actually I wiki how'd, how to be a good Christian, okay? I don't know if you guys ever use wiki how, it's good for some good laughs, all right? There's a couple articles on here. There was one for how to find a good Christian girl, so all you single boys, be, I didn't add that one in here. Um, but, but how to be a good Christian, according to wiki how, would you guys like to go through it this morning? Okay, so this is according to Wikipedia, these are the steps of becoming a good enough Christian. Number one, confess your sins to God. Okay, find a man behind a mesh screen and talk about your problems to him. Step two, try to avoid the temptation of vegetables, right? No apples in my life. There are goats outside, serpent. Your fruity flesh will not touch my mouth. But no, try to avoid the temptation of sin. This is how I become a good Christian. Or number three, treat others with love, charity, and forgiveness. It's kind of sweet. Another one, listen for God's calling for how you should serve others. Who might need a little pat on the shoulder once in a while? Come on. 
Number five, strengthen your bond with God by praying constantly, specifically at sunsets. Uh, (laughs) Another one, number six, donate some time, money, and possessions to others in need. And the last one, this is my favorite one. Number seven, take a Bible with you everywhere you go, okay? I'm not saying you have to read it, but you better make sure you have it, right? (laughs) What are these things? I'm not saying that they're bad. Okay, there's nothing wrong with taking your Bible to Walmart. That's great. But (laughs) these practices, maybe they're helpful and they're beneficial. They're nice. They're kind. But I've got to ask you today, church, are these the foundations? Are these the drawing lines between what makes you a good Christian or a bad Christian? See, I wonder when I ask that question, of what qualifies us as a good enough Christian. How many of our minds went to something that we do? I've asked this question to our youth before, and the answers I get are things like, well, I don't vape, right? It goes pretty long ways, you know? I talked to the weird kid at school. I, I didn't get mad at my mom when she told me to clean my room. I don't cheat on my tests, right? Like, our minds go to our behaviors. But is your behavior the basis of what makes you, in the eyes of God, good enough? What makes us a good Christian? Check this out. That verse I read for you at the beginning, what is the basis of a mature believer? What is the basis of somebody who is growing in godliness? What is the basis of leveling up your faith? What is the basis of what makes you good enough? What is the difference between receiving Jesus and walking in Jesus? As you therefore have received him, so walk in him. What does this not say? It doesn't say because you received him, start walking in him. Or after you've received him, start walking with him. But what does walking with Jesus look like? Does it look like praying constantly? Does it look like giving things away to the Salvation Army? Does it look like bringing your Bible to Costco and everywhere else that you go? What is the basis of being good enough in the eyes of God? What is the basis of spiritual maturity? As you have received him, so walk in him. What is Paul saying here? That if Christ is sufficient to save you, then Christ is sufficient to sustain you. See, I like to think about it like this. Laura and I are expecting a baby, as many of you know, this coming December. We're pretty excited about it. It's pretty awesome. I can't wait to be a dad. And, uh, and over the summer, we found out that we are having a little girl. And, uh, and I'm just like over the moon pumped about this. She's gonna be my little princess. She will do no wrong in my eyes. I'm gonna pamper her. I'm gonna spoil her. And, uh, and ever since I found out that it was a girl, I found my mind dominated on this one thought, okay? And hear me out in this. And it is the goal to become as large and physically imposing as possible to strike fear into the hearts of any boy that this girl may one day bring home, okay? She is not even here yet, and I'm already ready to get my gun license, okay? I I mean, hopefully, this is like 30, 40, 50 years away, right? It's like, take your time, take your time. But Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither am I, okay? So I'm like, I gotta start working now on building my future dad bod. And, uh, and, so, and so I've been working out a little bit more consistently. I've been trying to lift weights. I've been trying to eat a little bit more food. I've been trying to put on a little bit of muscle. And, uh, and one of the things I learned, if you guys work out, if you exercise, if this is a priority for you, then you know that it's not just about what you do in the gym, but it's really important about what you're eating as well. And that if you wanna gain strength, if you wanna get muscle, then you need to eat a sufficient amount of protein. 
And so I started looking at my boxes of Kraft Dinner and Ichiban and realizing that I was not eating enough protein. Believe it or not, but Pizza Hut pizza does not have that much protein in it. And, uh, and so rather than, you know, changing what I'm eating, I have started going to Costco and buying those giant bags of protein powder. Okay? And I just started throwing protein into everything I eat. If it's yogurt, I got protein in there. In, in just a glass of milk, I put protein in it. If it's a smoothie, I'm putting protein in it. My oatmeal, I put protein in it. Why? Because my food is insufficient. Hear me out in this. The need for a supplement. Why do we take things like protein? We wouldn't do it if we were getting enough in our diet. That if from the food that I was eating, I was taking in enough protein to build strength, then I wouldn't need to take protein on the side. But the reason we take supplements is because the food that we are eating is insufficient to meet our needs. Now, I say this because I wonder sometimes that like my diet and like the Colossians, that sometimes we are trying to add things to our faith because we some way somehow think that the food isn't good enough. That we're trying to add things to the gospel. That we're praying all the time and, 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 and we're taking our Bible on the road and we're giving things away and I'm not saying these things are wrong, but are we doing it out of the outflow of our lives, or are we doing it because we think some way, somehow, I need to supplement the gospel? But church, were you saved by a supplement? Were you saved by protein powder? That <laughs> It begs the question of having been justified by faith, are we now being saved by works? Having been justified by faith, are we now made complete by what we can do? Are we now made complete by what we can offer? Having been saved by faith, when did we stop trying to add something to the cross? That when did we decide that the bread of life just wasn't enough? As you received him, so walk in him. Supplement free, protein free, the fully organic gospel. Why? Because for in him dwells all the fullness, not some of the fullness, not a portion of the fullness, but in him, not in your works, not in your efforts, not in your good deeds or your good intentions, but in him. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you, this is you, this is the person sitting next to you, this is the person that you see in the mirror. You are complete in him. You are complete in him. See, the Colossians had this idea that in order to level up their faith, that in order to grow in godliness, that in order to, to make themselves a good Christian, in order to be good enough in the eyes of God, it came down to either something that they could do or something they could have. They looked into secret knowledge because that's something I can control. That's something that I can seek. Or they looked at their rigorous discipline. They looked at the things that they would abstain themselves from, these things that they could control in their hands, thinking that this will make me whole, that this is the satisfier of my soul's. But I think about it like this. A couple of years ago, Laura and I, we were invited over from some friends of ours to a little cabin in the woods. They have this cabin out on a place called Christina Lake. And uh, it's this beautiful spot. It's got like a little beach with a dock right on the water. It's awesome. And we pull up there. And this time we had brought our dog Carl with us. And now Carl is coming out of like an eight-hour road trip. So he's just like buzzed up, ready to go. He is like the physical embodiment of Red Bull. If you took Red Bull and just put fur on it, that is my dog. And, uh, and so we open up the door and Carl just like flies out of that thing, ready to go. He sprints down the steps and he finds our friends on the dock and he's so excited to see them. He's so excited to say hi, but he still had his leash dangling on behind him. 
And in the midst of his running and his sprinting and his excitement, he somehow got his leash tangled around this little toy truck. It was like one of those little ones that like a kid would sit on and they like kind of scoot around on. And so his leash gets all tangled around this truck and he looks behind him. He's like, oh my gosh, this thing is following me. And so he starts running faster and the thing just moves with him. And so he's like freaking out. His tail is tucked. He's like, buzzing around in every direction. He takes off, I kid you not, like a kilometer down the beach. And we just see this like little spot of Carl just sprinting his heart out, like, help me, help me, help me. And he's running, he's running. He comes back the other way and he comes running back towards us. And, and he's panicking and he's terrified. He's yelping. He's like crying out in fear and terror. And finally, Laura just squats down and she opens up her arms. And this 80 pound dog comes barreling towards her and like a little baby jumps into her arms. It was this beautiful moment actually. But I think that in that moment, Carl understood something that I think sometimes the Colossians and us and WikiHow fail to realize. See, the Colossians thought that what would make them complete was something that they could attain or something that they have. They thought that the answer they would find within themselves. But again, Carl understood something I think that we sometimes fail to realize, is that in his moment of toy-filled terror, he realized that the solution was not in himself. He realized that not only did he lack thumbs and a brain, uh, <laughs> But he lacked the ability to free himself from this situation. And so in his moment of need and in his moment of lack, what did he do? Is he turned not to himself, but as Laura opened up her arms, he turned to his Savior. I think what Carl realized is that in our moment of need, we don't find wholeness in ourselves. It's not something we do that makes us complete. But in our seasons and moments of lack, the thing that completes us is in something that we offer. It's a savior. For you are complete in him. What is it that qualifies us? What is it that makes us whole? For you are complete in him. For in him, you also were circumcised. What does it mean by circumcised? I don't want to go into the details of that. It's every teenage boy's worst nightmare. But what he's symbolizing is not the physical act of circumcision, but he's referring to the symbolic act of circumcision. What is circumcision? It's the sign of the covenant. That what he's saying is that on this covenant, this is the basis of God's commitment and his faithfulness to his people. And so why is God committed to us? Because we are in him, by Christ, by our identity hidden in him. What is Paul doing? He is drawing a line of identification, that we are one with Christ, and in him we are partakers of the covenant with God, that in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made with our hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, and you were buried with him in baptism. What is he doing now? He's drawing another line of identification. That he's showing how we are partakers of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. We're buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. That what is he saying? He's saying that church, it is no longer you who live, but it is Christ who lives in you. And the basis, the standard of what makes you good enough, of what qualifies you in the eyes and the sight of God is not in anything that you can do or anything that you can offer. That it is not built on the basis of our WikiHow articles or bringing our Bibles to Walmart. That what makes you a good Christian. What qualifies you as good enough is the fact that what Jesus did on the cross was good enough. And so we don't have to add something to that. It's a finished work. 
It's a finished faith. We can leave the couscous on the side. We don't need to add it to the dish because this meal is sufficient to meet our needs. Do you hear me in that church? The cross is enough. The blood is enough. Jesus Christ is enough. For in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. I want to finish off with just one more verse. For you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out, not ignored, not set aside, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed powers and principalities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over it. Come on, you guys. Is that not good enough? Do you need to add something to what Jesus did? I'm sorry. I'm going to bring my Bible to Costco later. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to add to what he already did. All right? I'm going to pray tonight before I go to bed as an outflow of my relationship with God but it's not going to undo or outdo what he's already done. This is what completes me. This is what makes me whole. The cross has always been, will always be, and is right now good enough. I don't think I'm good enough in God's eyes because of anything I do. I'm good enough in God's eyes because of what has already been done. I am good enough because he is good enough. And in me lives the spirit of Christ. 